Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on online consumer protection, where we're asking how we can promote a safer internet in the EU. My name is Dave Keating. I'm a journalist based in Brussels. I'm going to be walking us through today's conversation, which is about the internet and using the internet at the same time. So we know that the internet is an integral part of everyday life for millions of European citizens. Last year, it was found that 80% of people living in the EU use the internet on a daily basis. But as the internet and its use continues to grow and change our everyday life, often for the better, sometimes for the worse, protecting consumers online has never been more important. In recent years, we've seen how the internet can be used to spread hate speech, share fake news, scam or defraud citizens, undermine privacy, or even harm children. While many companies have taken steps to improve safety on their online platforms, regulation of consumer protection online has often been inconsistent or fragmented. The EU, for its part, has recently taken big leaps to regulate the internet through the Digital Services Act and the General Data Protection Act, GDPR. So today we're going to discuss what's being done by various online actors, including gambling, to protect their customers and to keep the internet free, open, vibrant, and secure. We'll hear a presentation of a new study by KPMG reviewing the online consumer protections of various online services, including online betting companies. And this discussion is very timely for that sector as it comes during this year's European Safer Gambling Week. So let's go through the agenda. We're going to start with two presentations, uh, one from Virginia da Silva from the European Commission's Justice Department, and another from Elaine McCormick, Associate Director at KPMG, who's going to tell us about that study I was mentioning before. Then we'll move on to the panel discussion. We'll bring in Dario Lanasov mm -hmm. from Twitter, and also Vasiliki Panosi, Manager of EU Affairs at the European Gaming and Betting Association. So let's start with the um we're going to start actually i think virginia is having some problems connecting so we're going to start with the presentation of the study first so elaine uh, tell us about this this study that you guys have done looking at consumer protection and comparing various online services what did you guys find elaine well firstly good morning everybody and thanks very much to the gba for inviting me along to share the findings of the study with you it's actually been a, a really really interesting project to work on over the last couple of months and um, as, as dave says we were invited or we were asked to undertake an engagement to compare the terms and conditions on the website of the six member firms primarily of the egba we were asked to compare members in both denmark and the united kingdom so we could get a comparison across both jurisdictions. Um, and I think those two jurisdictions were specifically chosen purely because EGBA members have licenses, um, or all of them have licenses in those countries. So it provided a really good baseline for comparison. But as well as looking at the member firms, as Dave has already said, we were asked to look at a number of different sectors that provided services online, primarily targeted adult um, activities. So things like you'll see there, you know, social media platforms, um, looking at financial services, relationship and dating sites, looking at alcohol retailers, and also video gaming and esports. Just to make clear, the, the study wasn't intended to be a competitive exercise to determine how one sector or whether one sector was, was stronger than another. The intentions were purely just to look at the protections in place within the gambling companies, but actually how they also fitted in line or, or, or fitted in, in line with the protections provided by the other online sectors. You can see there we've detailed the five different distinct areas that we had a look at. So that first one, know your customer. And looking at that, we focused on things like um, identity and age verification and other ways in which companies get to know their clients. We looked at customer safety, so things like usage, um, tracking usage, tracking time and spending where that was appropriate, as well as different matters that would result in suspension of accounts across the board, but also actually how easy was it for customers to contact customer service. Um, data protection, so our study incorporated privacy provisions, things like the use of cookies, how well users were advised that the integrity of their data and, and how the data was actually used and stored. 
Um, Anti-money laundering, so looking at that, it's obviously a very hot topic at the moment in, across a lot of different industries, but we looked at how maybe suspicions were reported, um, ongoing monitoring of customers as well. So we, we didn't just look at money laundering, but we were kind of focused on others, so kind of um, fraud and, and other illegal means. And then finally, advertising, we looked really at how third party agreements and how customers were advised that their details were being used for um, when it came to advertising. So you can see at the top that those bullets there, um, we selected companies for our survey. We chose a mix actually of some companies that had offerings in both countries just to see whether there was a difference in the requirements within the different countries. But also we selected some individual uh, companies in each jurisdiction, particularly where companies within a sector were more bespoke. For the likes of alcohol retailers, they didn't have the same retailer didn't supply um, both the UK and Denmark. So we had um, one of each in there. We purely undertook desktop research. We didn't contact the companies at all. What we wanted to do was look at the information that was actually available in the public domain. Um, usually contained in the specific terms and conditions that was where we found the majority of the invite or there were specific links on websites and um, most commonly that was really for the case of the likes of data protection policies and cookies policies the results of our survey have all been anonymized so all member firms were randomly numbered just in order to preserve privacy so what i won't be sharing on the presentation today is the names of the different companies that we looked at because well, a, I don't have their consent to do so, but you know, we wanted to, to make it an anonymous study. But what I want to make clear just at the start is that our analysis didn't include any assessment of compliance with statutory obligations. So we weren't testing whether somebody was compliant with the obligations. It was purely an assessment that was of, of the information that was publicly available and actually how comprehensive that we, uh, we analysed that. Sorry, I've got some feedback from somebody. I don't know whether we can go on mute. That's better. Um, if, can we just move on to the next slide, please, on the presentation? Fantastic. I think this slide looks fairly busy, but hopefully it's fairly impactful just setting out where we considered that companies had either detailed, moderate or limited or, or, or no information in respect to the different areas that we reviewed. I think, you know, it's really pleasing to note the number of green areas across the different companies, across the different sectors and across the different jurisdictions as well. And our findings showed that the majority of the member firms, their websites had really comprehensive and easily accessible information within their terms and conditions in most of the areas that we looked at. There was one, one outlier, one member firm did actually require an account to be opened before we were able to view terms and conditions. So that, that was an outlier within the industry. But once an account was opened, the terms and conditions on there were really easily accessible. I think conversely, the non-member of firms didn't have a lot of detail in a number of areas other than the financial services industry. Um, probably not unexpected for that type of industry. The financial services industry has been really heavily regulated for a number of years. Um, but actually, given the services, the types of services provided by the non-member firms, we wouldn't actually consider that to be unusual in a lot of the areas we looked at. And I'll explain that as we go through, as I go through a little bit further detail through the next part of the presentation. Um, you probably see from that table, there's two areas that all firms across both non-member and members had full information on, specifically in the UK, and that was data protection and advertising. But what I want to do is just have a bit of a whistle stop tour and, and, and just look at the different areas, particularly where there wasn't detailed information online. Um, so let's have a look at your customer first of all. There was only one member firm out of all six that had partial information, and that was on their Danish website. Everybody else had detailed information publicly available. Um, for non-member firms, no KYC requirements at all noted on the websites in either of the jurisdictions for, for esports, only partially present on the UK site for the alcohol retailer, and actually not present on the Danish site when it came to alcohol retailer. For everybody else, it, it, there were at least moderate or partial information on the non-member firm websites compared to the member firms and, and, and their peers. When it came to customer safety, really pleased, and I think to note that all member firms had detailed information relating to customer safety. None of the non-member firms, though, had detailed information regarding their wider customer safety practices. I think it's, it's, 
important that I point out that just because information isn't within terms and conditions, it doesn't mean to say that there internally aren't policies and procedures in place that perhaps wouldn't be available to us as members of the public, or things are just not stated in their terms and conditions. I think a good example to, to um, demonstrate that is when we consider safety, particularly in terms of gambling companies, um, affordability has really been at the key. It's really been at the forefront of considerations, you know, not letting people with gamble with money that they can't afford. If you then compare that to something like financial services, also very heavily regulated, which shows as amber and red on our reports, affordability in that respect would be um, looking at lending to customers, making sure people aren't borrowing more than they can afford to pay back. And that has had really heavy oversight for a number of years, albeit I guess that would be um, more in terms of conditions of a specific product. So if you, for example, go to take out a mortgage, there's going to be terms and conditions around you know, the amount that you can borrow and the, the criteria around then. So just because something's not in the general terms and conditions, it doesn't mean to say that it wouldn't be in a, in a product service um, term and conditions. Just moving on to data protection, that was actually one of the strongest categories that we found. Uh, the majority of the companies had really detailed information spanning across both jurisdictions, only two exceptions being the esports um, company based in Denmark and also the Danish alcohol retailer. I think potentially, and as Dave mentioned before, you know, GDPR came in, I think it was 2018, back in May 2018. So it really strengthened the requirements right across the board in, in a number of different areas, but particularly in respect of data protection. So it was good to see that that, that was a real area of strength. Um, Anti-money laundering, only two of the member firms um, had just partial information in respect of anti-money laundering practices, both within the Danish and the UK sites, and all others had pretty detailed information on there. And the majority of non-member firms, again, other than financial services, didn't have any information in relation to AML. But actually, we really wouldn't consider that to be unusual, given the types of activities that are carried out by those firms. And then just finally, advertising, um, an other really strong category in addition to data protection, particularly for the UK, where all companies, so both members and non-members, had really detailed information on their websites. In looking at the member firms, you'll see there, there was only one company that had limited information on its Danish site in respect of advertising. Everybody else did have full information spanning both Denmark and the UK. And I think... We found that although there was detailed information on the UK sites, the majority of the non-member firms had limited information on, um, on their Danish sites when it came to advertising. So I know it's kind of allocated 10 minutes for this uh, side of my presentation. It's a fairly whistle-stop tour of the, the key findings. The full findings are going to be set out within our report, um, which I understand is, is due to be published on the EGBA website by the end of the week. And I'm sure Barry will, will correct me if I'm wrong there. But, you know, overall, I think a number of firms' terms and conditions were pretty standard across the company. So where we looked at companies that spanned across both jurisdictions, and um, there was evidence, though, that they had been tailored to meet the country-specific requirements where there was different obligations within each country. Um, I think it's important as well, actually, that I make it clear, you know, we're not saying that there's a regulatory requirement to have all of this information in the terms and conditions. For when it comes to anti-money laundering, you know, there's no regulation that says you need to let somebody know in your terms and conditions when you're going to report them if you've got suspicions. Um, but I think overall, our findings show that the member firms came out really strongly um, in, the, in, in pretty much every area that we looked at in respect of making customers aware of the protections in place. Um, I think probably whether customers actually read terms and conditions is, a, is another debate. But actually, I think it's important to finish off by saying that, you know, just because something is stated in terms and conditions, it doesn't actually mean to say that it happens in practice. Or just because something isn't stated in terms and conditions, it doesn't mean that it doesn't. So that's it. That's that's kind of whistle stop tour of our findings of the study. I hope that was interesting. Great. Thanks, Elaine. That is super interesting. If you guys at home have questions for Elaine, you're going to be able to ask them later to her and to the other panelists. You'll see a Q&A feature, question feature uh, there on GoToWebinar. You can go ahead and type in your questions now if you'd like, and I'll be reading those out to the panelists later on. So I'm pretty sure we have Virginia on the line now by phone. Virginia, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, 
Great, yes, we can. So okay. allow me to introduce you next for your presentation. So uh, Virginia is from the European Commission's Justice Department, as I mentioned before. Uh, so Virginia, tell us a little bit about what the EU is doing to create a safer internet. Yeah, thank you. And I, I must say, I'm really sorry for being so late. I was facing a connection issue. Um, so yeah, well, uh, my name is Virginia da Silva. I'm a lawyer working for European Commission and precisely for DigiJust E3, which is in charge, uh, which is a unit in charge, sorry, of consumer enforcement and redress. Um, so we, so sorry. Um, can you just change the slide, please? Yeah, thank you. Um, so as I said, we are in charge of the protection of the consumer and more precisely of the uh, inf enforcement uh, of consumer law and redress. We are closely working with the Consumer Protection Network, which is composed of CPC authorities representing the different member states. Um, under the UCPD regulation of 20, uh, uh, 2000, sorry, and uh, 17, they work together in order to identify um, notably online irregular commercial practices of rogue traders operating in different member states. CPC authorities are entitled to take speedy actions against those traders and expect from them some commitments. The Commission and the CPC authorities give uh, special attention to vulnerable consumers. It's really important for us to, 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 to pay attention to vulnerable consumers uh, within the, the different actions that take place uh, and for which we are uh, supervising uh, supervisor. Um, our unit is also supervising, supervising uh, European consumer centers, uh, which is also called uh, ECCs, ECCs, and their role is to assist consumers with cross-border purchases in the EU, Norway, and in, I in Iceland. Uh, they also uh, inform consumers about their rights and educate vulnerable consumers throughout uh, educational campaigns. I'm talking about that because uh, we will uh, see um, specific activity uh, which could be relevant for this webinar uh, and um, which was organized by this e ECCs later on. Um, can you change the slide, please? Thank you. Uh, for those who are not aware, um, 2022 is the European Year of Youth, meaning that a lot of our activities are directed to the European youth and in order to build a better future, let's say greener, more inclusive and digital. In that context, we decided to focus on consumer protection in online games. Um, this is not a real new topic. The CPC authorities have already taken um, CPC action on marketing of online games in the past. Um, there, the CPC network required from the internet platform providers uh, Apple and Google, but as well as the Association of Online Game Developers, the uh, ISFE, to clearly identify in in-app purchases, sorry, in in online games, and address issues relating to misleading advertising of games as free. Um, um, they, we also require them to, um, I mean, we also uh, inform, 
then about uh, the, the restriction of direct exhaustion to children to purchase. And uh, we also address issues on how parents can better control in, in intended purchases made in games. Uh, this action was taken based on the insert commercial practices of 2005 and the consumer rights directive um, and their, of course, their respective guidances. Um, online video games have seen a rapid increase uh, in the use of loot boxes. Uh, that raise concern for many stakeholders and also the European Parliament. And in this context, and considering the fact that uh, when loot boxes are offered for a price, it can be seen as an in-app purchases, we decided to write again a letter to the online video game industry in order to remind them the enforcement principles settled in, settle in the common action pre previously mentioned, uh, but also to inform about the new disposition of the updated uh, UCPD guidance. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. We also directed our activity uh, to the enforcers and to the vulnerable consumers. Um, in September 2022, we organized a masterclass on manipulative practices targeting children in online gaming. And this masterclass was kind of training for uh, C the CPC network. Member states here shared their own experience concerning the protection of consumer in online games, and they discussed different issues related to that subject. Finally, the CCs, and more precisely um, European, the European Com Consumer Centre of Australia, Cyprus, Greece, Luxembourg, Portugal, Slovakia, and Sweden, developed an educational toolkit for young consumers. This tool should help teachers um, to discuss the topic of video games with children and teenagers uh, during English classes. Next slide, please. Thank you. For the Commission, um, the Internet is a great place to learn, play, share, watch, uh, connect and express ourselves. Therefore, the Commission decided to develop a new strategy to make sure that all the young people um, feel safe, happy and uh, empowered when, whenever they go online. The Better Internet for Kids Plus had been adopted on the 11th of May 2022. As this project uh, is conducted by DG Connect and not by our DG, I can only say a few words about that. Um, its goal is to ensure the protection, the respect and the empowerment of children online in the new digital decade. It, uh, this strategy is based on three main pillars, let's say. Um, safe digital experience for children first. Um, this is to ensure an appropriate uh, digital environment or infrastructure for children. Uh, digital empowerment, this means that, uh, I mean, we are trying to ensure children that, uh, that children have um, the necessary skills to benefit from the digital transformation and that they can become confident and competent uh, digital adults. Finally, active participation, this is to ensure uh, children's view uh, that children's views are 
sought out and taken into account by the industry policy policymakers, and that um, yeah, that, that, that's the main point. Um, our unit is supporting financially uh, this project. Indeed, we decided to transfer this year one. Uh, dot five millions of credit for a two year period uh, to DG Connect in order to reinforce big centers' ca capacities in creating tools dedicated to raise awareness among parents, children, and educators and to the empowerment of vulnerable consumers. Um, so, in case you are interested by this initiative and want more information, you can always visit uh, the Better Internet for Kids website, which is re really clear and which is uh, which has a lot of information about this initiative. So, feel free to to visit it. Well, that's all for me. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Virginia. Um, a couple follow-up questions for you. Uh, particularly, I wanted to get some clarification about some of the terms you were using. Um, so for one thing, when you say uh, online games, you do mean video games, correct? Yeah, yeah, well, we focused on video games, yeah. Okay, great. But, um, so also, but oh, also we are aware that uh, online games, we, when we talk about online games, we can also uh, refer to the game that we uh, have access via social, social uh, media. I don't know if you are referring about that. Yeah. That makes sense. I just wanted to see how how encompassing that that definition was. Um, also, you yeah. you were talking about the, the vulnerable consumer. How does the commission define what is a vulnerable consumer? Well, when we speak about vulnerable consumer, we first think about children for sure. But it's a little bit more complicated, as you you may know, um, compared to the average consumer who is considered to be uh, able to make rational choices to find the best deal, let's say, and benefit from the competitive market. Um, vulnerable consumer are not considered to be able to do so for various reasons. Um, you can find some reference of the vulnerable consumer within the, the EU legislation protecting consumers like the CRD, the Consumer Right Directive, the General Product Safety or the Regulation on Online Dispute Resolution. Um, but you also can find a definition uh, in the Intercommercial Practices Directive, which says that um, the vulnerable consumer uh, is the one who uh, is particularly vulnerable due to his or her mental uh, or physical infirmity, age or credu credulity. But of course, uh, this definition um, receives a lot of criticism because it seems to be too strict and uh, for us we should agree uh, i mean we should agree that uh, digital vulnerability exists and that um, it applies to all consumer in digital markets so meaning that everyone can be uh, vulnerable online Okay, makes sense. You also talked about loot boxes. Could you go a little bit more into what loot boxes are and also what is the legal framework at EU level for loot boxes? Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, loot boxes is a kind of um, controversial uh, subject. Everyone, I mean, uh, for those who don't know, uh, loot boxes are kind of a random context a content, uh, I mean, box that allowed you to that give you access to random content. Uh, it could be items. Uh, well, it could be different things. But when you click on the box, you are not uh, aware of the content uh, of the box, and that's the the what is 
the, the, the loot box. Um, there is, at the EU, EU level, there is a lack of uh, nominalized legislation. The legal qualification dif differs, uh, differs uh, there is a different um, quali legal qualification within the, the member states, and in some member states, loot boxes can be considered as gambling. Um, even if uh, there is a difference um, on legal qualification uh, within the member states, we consider uh, that consumer law still applies to the, to, to the loot boxes. And the sale of loot boxes must comply notably with the Consumer Right Directive and the UCPD. Meaning that when loot boxes are offered for a price they might be, as they might be seen as an in-app purchases. Uh, they should um, comply with all the um, the disposition of the CRD, the Consumer Right Directive, concerning the pre-contractual information. Therefore, uh, video games producer have to provide the yeah the required pre-contractual information before agree agreeing to download a game. Um, the, the consumer should be informed of the existence of in-app purchases, including loot boxes and direct exhortation to uh, purchase the children and aggressive practices are prohibited, uh, not under, of course, uh, the, the CRD, but under the, the Article 8 and 9 of the UCPD. Um, and it's also interesting to note that uh, the, the, the update of the UCPD guidance, um, I mean, thanks to the, the, the update of the UCPD guidance, this guidance has now a dedicated section on gaming and on loot boxes. Uh, and according to that guidance, for example, price information should be clearly disclosed when building several items in a package in order to understand uh, the advantage uh, earned uh, from building. Uh, and for, uh, another example is that in case of purchases, uh, purchased loot boxes, sorry, explanation of the probabilities of receiving a, a random item should be also provide. So, yeah, our point is, even if we do not have, it's true, an harmonization at the UU level on loot boxes, uh, consumer law should should be applied and, to, and the developer should, should Make sure that they are in compliance with the 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 consumer uh, the I mean the legislation protecting the consumer, and that's really important for us. Right. Well, thank you very much, Virginia, for giving us your thoughts. Let's move on to the panel now. So I'll bring thank in you. Elaine, Dario from Twitter, and Vasiliki from EGBA. Uh, Dario, let me start with a question for you. Um, so from Twitter's perspective, what do you think are the biggest threats for online consumers today? Uh, and what do you think can be done to address those threats, both at EU level and sectoral level? Thanks a lot, Dave. Uh, first of all, let me thank also EGBA for inviting me today. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here and to be among the, these uh, illustrious pa uh, panelists. Um, I, I'm actually uh, quoting your uh, your introduction. You mentioned the internet as uh, being so key for our society. It is indeed true. The internet has revolutionized the way people interact and exercise their freedom of expression and information. Uh, but the open internet, the open and free internet itself, is is under threat, and this should concern everybody. Um, as the regulatory debate uh, evolves globally, we, we see that there are proposals uh, that threaten the, the open, end, open internet as we know it. Uh, and uh, even uh, the government use of shutdowns and throttlings are also uh, spreading. 
Um, in our latest uh, transparency report, we raise our concerns uh, on, on such a global uh, trend that we observed, especially uh, related to the fact that these proposals are uh, fundamentally aiming at limiting the, the freedom of, of, of the press globally. Uh, even reporters without borders have, has registered an increase in uh, year 2022 for uh, press freedom being in very serious uh, situation. Uh, and even Access Now uh, has uh, showed that uh, um, there have been only in, in 2021 uh, more than 184 internet shutdowns. So these are all very concerning uh, statistics that again should concern everybody. Um, especially in a period of crisis like the one that we are living uh, right now, uh, uh, because you can see how the internet remains a space for defending uh, our freedoms. And uh, some uh, examples of these uh, come from the current demonstration in Iran uh, throughout uh, the testimonies uh, of the war in, in, in Ukraine. And at the same time, you see how authoritarian governments are increasing uh, the use of uh, access restriction uh, to make it uh, more uh, to adopt more repressive uh, policies in the in the digital environment. Now, uh, I believe this is um, pro protecting the, the, the open internet uh, should be a priority and, as I say, a concern for everybody. Uh, in a way, in, in Europe, the EU institutions have made a, a concrete step forward, as you mentioned, the, the adoption of the Digital Services Act uh, kind of avoided the fragmentation of uh, into 27 different national uh, internet, at least when it comes to uh, content moderation. Uh, but that's just um, uh, uh, that is just a step forward. I think we should uh, watch this uh, this space and uh, do not lower our guards. And as uh, there are already rumors of new proposals coming up next year on uh, the will affect uh, net neutrality uh, in uh, uh, in the EU. So we should continue watch this space. But I, I will stop here uh, and uh, happy to answer other questions later. Great, thanks a lot. Vasiliki, same question to you from the from the gaming perspective. What do you think are the biggest threats for online consumers today? So from a gaming perspective or gambling perspective, um, I would say that there are two major threats for the player online today. And uh, one of them comes from the uh, existence and popularity, I can say, of the black market. So offshore companies that offer gambling services without being regulated and without necessarily providing um, the safeguards that licensed and regulated websites do. Um, so as long as these sites are available and as long as um, regulatory uh, requirements um, limit channeling, um, so limiting the possibility of the consumer to be targeted to the regulated sites, uh, this threat exists. And to combat uh, the black market and to help uh, players play in a safe environment, um, I, I think, first of all, advertising plays uh, a very important role in order the player to be aware of where he or she can play safely. And of course, um, uh, regulatory cooperation and uh, uh, legislation that takes into account um, channeling rates. And second threat, I would like to mention the fact that um, so the framework, the legislative framework for EU gambling is uh, quite fragmented in the EU. Um, so this means that the consumer is not being protected in the same way let's say, in Belgium, as it is protected in uh, another EU country. Um, this, of course, uh, uh, creates many uh, uh, problems for the consumer um, and a lot of fragmentation. So um, for that and in the absence of common rules, uh, I think that uh, there is a need for um, greater regulatory cooperation between member states um, but of course also um, the industry to be united towards uh, responsibility and uh, responsible initiatives uh, and actions. 
Elaine, I'd like to go back to you um, with some questions about your study. So in the study, you reviewed the online consumer protections of different services. Um, but where, where did you find that the biggest and clearest gaps were in consumer protection there? I mean, if you think, and you, you look at our report, um, it kind of appears to be at first glance everything other than gambling and financial services, um, both of which are really heavily regulated and, and have been heavily regulated for a number of years. I think that's not to say that everything's perfect in financial services and, and in gambling where they have got fairly stringent regulation because far from it you know you look at some of the recent fines that have been levied by the regulators in both of those businesses and it's really apparent that it's not um i think that you know in in some of the other um in some of the other sectors the focus has really been previously on reliance on the user to provide correct information and to comply with laws and the rules laid down by different companies rather than actually the companies themselves necessarily always ensuring that the user does but i think there's an awful lot of pressure now particularly when you look at the media particularly when you look at the general public um, and the regulated bodies themselves as well so perhaps we might see a sea change there but i think the key really lies in um, in regulation and oversight by the relevant authorities of the other sectors i think when you delve into the study a little bit more and you'll see it when you you know when you see that the, the wider study there are some notable gaps in the other sectors, but actually we wouldn't expect all the protections that we considered to be appropriate and to be apparent in every industry. You know, for example, if somebody was going to launder money, they're not going to do that by signing up to a dating site where there's a limited payment. So actually not all the protections that we looked at are, are appropriate for all the sectors. You know, I mentioned that the study was limited to available information that was out there within the public domain. But you'll know, and I mentioned, I think, in the first part of the presentation, that a lot of firms have got internal policies and processes that run parallel to the information that's out there in the public domain that will actually provide further safeguards, you know, including things like who can access website, what kind of content goes on there, which actually we'll probably be unaware of as consumers, but actually doesn't mean to say that it's not being done behind the scenes. Sorry, I had to unmute there. Um, Elaine, another question for you. It's come in from the audience. And just a reminder, you guys uh, can put in your questions uh, to the panelists using the question feature. So we've had a question come in for you, Elaine, from Eamon B. Uh, so the question is, Elaine mentioned that for firm one, terms and conditions were not available until after registration, but was the privacy policy available before registration? That's a good question. And without actually going into our study, I, I'm not convinced that it was. I think we had to open an account to get everything. But in, in all honesty, with, with hand on heart, without going to look at the detail behind the study, I, I can't answer that, I'm afraid. OK, um, let's move on to some of the EU policies that I mentioned at the beginning. So for one thing, we have the Digital Services Act, which very much impacts the, the areas of the Internet we're talking about here. Um, Vasiliki, let me put this question to you. The, it, it's a very ambitious piece of legislation um, and, and really targeting in on a legal content. Do you think the DSA can be an effective tool for a safer internet broadly? Uh, and do you see any implications for its future application? Thanks, Dave. Um, I mean, yes, indeed. The DSA is uh, probably one of the most ambitious set of rules uh, against uh, illegal content that uh, are being published. Um, actually, yesterday, uh, the EU Parliament and Council agreed and signed uh, the, the, the law, so we can expect it to be, uh, to be for it to be <laughs> an official law uh, very soon and coming into force by uh, early 2024. Um, so as I said, um, it's very ambitious. Um, and the first implications that come to my mind comes from the fact that the broad of the, uh, the scope of the DSA is very broad, actually, because it targets uh, not only content that is illegal, apparently illegal in every EU member state, 
but also content that can be considered illegal by national um, uh, legislation or sometimes content that uh, can be infringing actually the terms and conditions of, uh, let's say, a social media platform. Um, this, of course, you understand that creates uh, a lot of uh, problems because what happens in cases where um, uh, something that is illegal in one member state is not illegal in another member state, and this is where gambling uh, comes in, um, or what happens in those countries where there is actually a rule of law problem. Uh, and as Dario mentioned before, um, the freedom of speech is uh, limited and uh, editorial content is being taken down for political reasons. Um, but of course, uh, there, is, there, there are more implications uh, other than that. Uh, and uh, it, will be, it will be a case of uh, time to see them uh, coming in the future, I think. Dario, what about you? What do you think are the implications, particularly for Twitter, of the DSA going forward? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Uh, first of all, I completely agree with what Vasiliki say. Uh, definitely, we would have loved to see the, the EU institutions to go a little bit farther with the DSA and agree on a uh, EU definition of illegal content. That would have made uh, things much easier. Uh, but it is what it is at the, uh, at the moment, and we need to uh, appreciate the effort that has been done. Uh, at least the DSA uh, makes it uh, create an harmonized way in which uh, illegal content can be uh, taken down. And it also, uh, we shouldn't forget, reaffirms uh, a fundamental principle that is very much to the core of the EU, which is the, the, the single market principle. So one set of rules for one market, which is uh, key. And at the same time, they, they, they managed to uh, safeguard the core principles of the e-commerce directive, which are uh, no obligation for general monitoring uh, when content is involved, a limited liability regime, and a country of origin principle. These are all uh, fundamental for, uh, for our single market, and especially the digital uh, single market. Now, the DSA in itself, uh, we find that it strikes a right balance between uh, freedom of speech and online uh, user safety. Um, Access Now has um, highlighted a few points uh, that, uh, that the DSA bring to the table, which is it gives more control and choice to the users harmonize the procedures that I was uh, say, mentioning before, and also greater accountability for uh, platforms. Of course, uh, this will require uh, a huge effort uh, on, uh, on our side to make sure that we can comply with all the provisions that are included in the, uh, in the DSA. It's not just a compliance work that stops the private sector, because the DSA is such a revolutionary piece of legislation that uh, you, cannot, uh, you cannot do this effort only on your own. Uh, government, authorities, regulators, civil society, companies, they need to cooperate to make sure that this is a successful uh, piece of legislation. Uh, and don't get me wrong, uh, I think it is already successful even before it comes into force. Um, it is bound to uh, inspire uh, uh, pieces of legislation around uh, the world, even throughout the, the negotiation uh, period uh, between the EU institutions. Uh, other countries in, in Asia were thinking of uh, adopting a DSA-like type of text in their uh, constituency. So it is uh, obviously eye-opening of the impact that the, the DSA has already had and we left. Uh, now I, I would like to mention uh, that I'm very proud to, to say that I've Twitter has already implemented some of the provisions that are included in the DSA and has, and has done so for quite some time. Since 2018, we already give uh, the, the option to users to uh, click off uh, and turn off all the uh, algorithm uh, suggested uh, content and, and you, you will only have uh, on your online uh, all the content based on chronological order. And uh, we already give access to, uh, to our data to vetted researchers via API since uh, quite a few years. Uh, so we're kind of the precursors on, on this field and uh, uh, I, I wouldn't have missed this opportunity to mention it. Lane, maybe, uh, Dave, oh, sorry for uh, interrupting. Uh, maybe something that I would like to add and maybe 
Dario can also comment, is that there will be cases where, so, so the DSA does not provide for a specific time frame under which a platform or an ISP shall take down content that is deemed as illegal, right? But there are provisions that sort of implying that this has to be done quickly in due time. So this means that there will be cases, for example, where, okay, maybe platforms receive notifications, let's say, about uh, violent content or uh, por uh, child pornography content, then it's, it makes no sense to wait. But what, uh, what about those cases where the legality of content needs to be um, assessed? There, there needs to be a legal assessment, for example, of whether this is actually legal or not. Um, will uh, platforms and ISPs, in this case, take their time to consult, let's say, uh, the content provider um, uh, which is responsible or a legal advisor, or will they just um, be rushed to take the content down just because they need to comply with the DSA? Yeah, Dario, um, how, how does Twitter plan to handle that? Uh, I mean, it, it is it is a valid question. We 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 shall see. Uh, but in the sense that it, this is common in uh, uh, in our world, um, we will always take uh, decisions based on 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 the legal background. Uh, so uh, I, I, the way our system works is that it is a is an hybrid approach composed of uh, human and artificial intelligence tool. Um, more than fifty percent of uh, of actionable uh, content so content that uh, that could be action is uh, surfaced thanks to artificial intelligence which means that uh, users do not do not have to report on that content it automatically surface and then the decision is taken always by uh, uh, one one of our colleague um, so this gives us the, the possibility to do all the appropriate uh, checks uh, to make sure that we are uh, following the law. Um, on the specificity of the of the DSA, this is uh, of course to uh, to be seen how uh, the implementation is going to work. We, we're going to have a lot of uh, discussions with with the Commission on how do exp they expect us to uh, to do so. Um, and uh, yeah, I will, uh, I will stop there. Elaine, I wanted to ask, um, in terms of the gaps that you identified in the report, how can EU policy um, fill in those gaps, particularly uh, using the DSA? I think it's important that the policymakers just put consumer protection at the heart of everything they do and, and look at adequate signposting for consumers so consumers can actually understand what their rights are and what the key protection measures are in place you know looking at who they're protecting look at how they're protecting them and actually how do consumers understand and know about the different protections that are there um i think if we look at the gambling companies in particular there have been some really hard lessons learned over the last few years particularly i mentioned before you know you see the levels of fines that are there when when people are getting that wrong but i think that shows that it's not just down to policymakers. it's actually you know you can have all the regulations and rules in the in, in the world in place but actually it's down to the companies to follow them and um, so you know it I think for me as well, as, as well as the policymakers, you know, it's really important to get culture right. A culture is a massive, a, a massive thing. It's, it's really at the forefront um, of of a lot of, of, of minds at the moment. You know, it starts at the top of, of not only every organization, but actually industries as a whole. And it's only by getting that culture right that things will um, that things will take will, will change. It's about firms taking their obligations seriously and making sure that filters through the whole company. So I think it's a kind of a two-step process. It's not just the policymakers, but there's a lot that policymakers could do there. Um, Vasiliki, one of the big concerns when we talk about these areas of online safety is obviously children. Um, the online world can be more dangerous for minors uh, than for adults, particularly with certain sectors, and that's certainly true with gambling. Children are not supposed to be gambling either in real life or online. Um, so what is the industry doing for self-regulatory measures to protect children online, and how 
how does the, how does the gambling sector make sure that children aren't getting involved? So indeed, protection of minors uh, is a very uh, important topic, and it's something that uh, our members um, uh, focus on. Um, first of all, maybe we I should just mention that um, underage gambling is illegal. Uh, it's prohibited by law in all the EU member states. Um, the legal age is usually 18. Uh, there are some member states that uh, this changes to 21 um, but it's uh, illegal uh, everywhere and um, um, the first tool that uh, gambling operators use to prevent uh, minors accessing gambling is age verification uh, and signposting on websites um, so with age verification we've seen that um, over the years uh, there is a shift, of course, obviously, to a more uh, digital way of verifying consumers, uh, which is uh, uh, in certain cases also very trustworthy and secure, because this is being done uh, by comparing data, the, the operator compares the um, identity data um, against governmental databases. Um, so there are a lot of member states today actually that uh, design uh, such databases um, specific for gambling purposes in some cases uh, so that the operators can do this uh, checking. Um, there are certain uh, jurisdictions that uh, this is mandatory so the only uh, secure way of verifying is uh, through um, the use of these databases. Um, while in some other member states, both uh, digital verification and uh, manual ver verification, which is actually sending hard copies of your ID to the operator, um, is being uh, mandated. Now, uh, in those cases where the governments do not provide such databases, gambling operators uh, either verify through third-party uh, verification systems, uh, such maybe they use uh, uh, the banks, for example, or in some other cases, this is done, as I said, manually, uh, or in some other cases, operators use their own, they develop their own uh, age verification systems. And maybe here I can provide some uh, data that uh, uh, in 2021, uh, I think, uh, there was uh, tw almost 23 million uh, euros invested in such uh, systems. Uh, when this is happening uh, manually, um, our members um, uh, actually employ experts to do that. Um, they provide the necessary training to these people. Um, so they can make sure that identities are uh, real and that the age verification is being done in a safe manner. Um, now, maybe something else that I uh, would like to mention is, uh, okay, what happens when uh, somebody wants to open a gambling account? Usually this triggers the age verification mechanism. Uh, but what happens until this is the complete? Uh, when it's not happening in a, for example, in an automated way, uh, there is a period where uh, players can either play or not, meaning that um, in certain countries, uh, before the verification is complete, uh, the, player are, the players are allowed to play in a temporary account, uh, while there are uh, other member states that prohibit uh, having temporary accounts. Uh, my point here is uh, to say that actually we can't say if it's uh, better to have a temporary account or better to prohibit them. Actually, it is the Commission recommendation on consumer protection of 2014 that encourages the use of temporary uh, accounts because, in a simple way, if they are not, if players are not allowed to play in these temporary accounts. Uh, it's very likely that they will search some, somewhere else to do it, which, as I mentioned earlier, is not uh, always uh, safe. So um, the use of temporary accounts can be a solution to this, uh, to this problem. And if the account is being closed because the age verification is not uh, completed, uh, then in most of the cases, uh, all the deposits go back to the player minus the winnings. 
uh, so there is no case of, uh, let's say, uh, loss. Okay, great. Well, that's about all the time we have for today's webinar. I think we've heard a lot of quite interesting contributions in terms of developments about where we're heading in terms of online safety, both from the regulatory perspective and also from a private sector perspective in terms of what's being done on the ground. And certainly now uh, it will be helpful for both policymakers and uh, people in the sector itself to have this KPMG report to be able to look at where those gaps lie. Uh, and kind of what needs to be done in the overall framework. So I want to thank our panelists very much for some very enlightening contributions this morning, and I want to thank you at home for spending your morning with us. I wish you all an excellent rest of the day. Take care.